welcome to another episode of 10x market podcast if you're coming here for the first time make sure you follow and subscribe to us on your favorite channel we are available on youtube spotify and apple podcast today we have nava hopkins with us she's a well known ppc expert and we are discussing a very very important topic that is so close to heart for the most marketers that is how to effectively utilize the ad platform while reaching out to your customer at each stage of their journey. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Nava Hopkins. I'm the evangelist over at Optimizer. Uh, I'm very honored and humbled. I was named the, the number three PPC influencer uh, in the uh, st- state of PPC study. Uh, I speak quite a bit on the circuit. Uh, I write for Search Engine Journal, Search Engine Land. And I'm on the board of the Paid Search Association. So all that's to say, I'm very, very blessed in the amount of data I get to collect and look at. And I, I love helping people. So very grateful to, to be here and have that opportunity to, to share. Nava, welcome once again. And I'm really glad to have you here. I would straight away come to the uh, topic and ask you the first question. So when we talk about the user journey, Mm-hmm. it's very important uh, that we fit uh, the ad platforms or the role of uh, paid marketing exactly where it should be so maybe if you can briefly touch upon uh, how customer journey is mapped uh, and how the ad platform helps you when you're running the uh, marketing campaign for any brand any product so I, I I love this question because a lot of people will use Google for everything and specifically Google search for everything. And what's really interesting is that there's a whole world out there beyond Google, think Microsoft, think Amazon, think LinkedIn, TikTok, and the places where it's not banned yet, um, Meta, Instagram. And so there, there's a whole number of platforms. What I think is also really interesting is that a lot of people tend to think that visual content is top of funnel only and that text content is exclusively for bottom of funnel. And that's kind of not true either. A lot more people are engaging with visual content for impulse purchases, particularly in e-commerce or for aspirational purchases like in travel. Uh, But then there's also uh, platforms like Threads where text is in fact very much that engagement piece. And while it's not technically an ad buy, it is still that, that text communication Uh, kind of inspiring top of funnel thoughts. So when we're thinking about our uh, ad channels, the first consideration is how much will it cost for you to own the full of the conversation from planting the seed of desire or need all the way down to they've become a customer and you're now nurturing more and more lifetime value out of them. If you can afford to fully own it, you are likely going to leverage Google's um, many ad products, think demand generation, which we can talk about in depth, think performance max, think standalone search, think YouTube, uh, think local service ads, if if you're on the local side, uh, shopping, if if you're in e-commerce, there's there's a number of tools there. If, however, you don't have the budget for to fully own everything, you may decide that you want to invest a little bit in social. Um, So think Meta, think Instagram, think Snap, think Pinterest, uh, think Quora, Reddit, um, for those kind of top of funnel interests that you can then tag people with their consent uh, to follow up on that conversation. However, if you're not as visually aligned, as in you either don't have the creative resources to really make visual work, you are going to want to really think about Microsoft and Google in tandem, where you might go for your more expensive ideas with Microsoft Search and let Google kind of clean up your branded, as well as potentially uh, some of those kind of cheaper, wild and crazy ideas. A very uh, common trick, or not common, but uh, fun trick, I'll say, uh, is to actually bid on the misspelling of the close variant of the keyword concept you want to go after, so that you actually get cheaper traffic Um, But it's the same high quality because of of that close variant. So actually bidding on the misspelling instead of the actual keyword concept you want, if you don't have the budget for it, very powerful way uh, to get that traffic. But throughout all of this, you only are going to be able to own your channel 
if you're correctly tagging everything and you have a really strong CRM system or means to take in that client information. Um, and you need to make sure that it's correct. So before you do anything, make sure that you have your conversion tracking set. And if you have questions about that, we can talk about it as well as your CRM system or your sales system. Now, I am uh, getting so many follow-up questions in my mind while you were talking about it. I would try to go uh, and remember them one by one. But first of all, uh, the most important part is the top of the funnel audience or people who are uh, in the awareness stage or you are trying to introduce your brand. So mm -hmm. which channel, which ad, which type of ad works best for in your experience and how the brand should approach uh, those audience? Sure. So top of funnel is really good for ins inspirational visual content for sure, but it can also actually be a very meaningful place to begin with organic. Um, it can also be a very meaningful place to begin um, with a text ad that's adjacent and you're using audiences to basically let your competitors pay for that intent. So there's something called in-market audiences that are very powerful. They let you, based off of different signals and different times, based off of vertical, know that someone is in market for the product or service. And they range from things like auto to buying a commercial building. They, they range all over. Different ad networks have different types of in-market audiences. So on the Google side, most people are fairly familiar with that taxonomy. If you're not, I'm sure we can have a visual or I can link to it um, in, in the follow-up notes. But the other thing that's actually very interesting is uh, what's it called? The Amazon audiences um, that will use Amazon Garage data, Whole Foods shopping data, Amazon Prime uh, streaming information. So those audiences for in-market are super, super powerful. So you don't want to neglect those. And given the fact that you're able to serve those ads on Amazon uh, or on IMDb, uh, Twitch, or, or any of the other par uh, partners within or partner sites within Amazon, very, very powerful resource. Now, in terms of uh, what's it called? Um, custom intent audiences, this is another very powerful, powerful type, is to actually target someone's website, maybe even your competitors. So the fact that someone's already starting to look at your competitors, it's a pretty good sign that they could be interested in what you have to offer. So that can be a very powerful audience to layer on top of your campaigns. It is important to remember that an audience must have at least a thousand people in it in order to target. It can have a hundred people to be a seed audience for demand gen or for Meta's lookalikes. So if you're struggling to get enough people in your cohort, and we can talk about uh, consent and how much that, that plays in, you'll want to make sure that you actually lay a uh, layer in demand gen or Facebook's lookalike. So you can at least take advantage of that, of the people that did say yes to sharing their marketing information to, to be uh, that seed. And when I talk about a seed audience, that means that the ad network is going to look at the people that you've uh, brought together and it will, based off of the percentage that you say you're comfortable with, find people that are similar to or look like that group. Um, this is not as cold as an in-market audience uh, because the in-market audience is someone who's just shown that behavior based off of whatever signals. The seed audiences, uh, so lookalike, uh, whether it's demand gen or uh, meta, which it, with their, are similar for Google, lookalike for, for meta, um, those will be a little bit warmer because they're fundamentally based off of your customers. That was a lot. Any, any yeah, yeah I know, I know, I know. And that's, that's great, actually. At the same time, uh, I think uh, there is another aspect to uh, top of the funnel audience. So whatever we talked about so far is more for a brand that is already established, a concept that is already known in the market. But there is something which is completely novel. There is something which is coming for the first time and you have to educate your customer. In that case, uh, do you take the similar approach or uh, you have uh, to take a different approach? Because in that case, you might not have that kind of in-market audience or that kind of luxury because 
the customer is not aware of the concept it is coming for the first time what do you mean it, what do you mean that they're not aware are you talking about the something agency? that is completely new let's say there's a software which uh, uh, creates your uh, video or records uh, an ai podcast so maybe there's nothing like that already in the market right but so, there are things that are similar to it so if someone is looking for a recording software they might be interested in business software or uh things related to, or or people who are are related to to influencer marketing so there's a type of audience actually uh that's not quite an audience but you're targeting uh YouTube channels uh within Google uh where you can target people who subscribe to a, a given channel or who watch certain videos and those influencers especially if you know that you've already kind of engaged that influencer to start talking about what it is that you offer it can be very very powerful um there is a really great study i, I forget who did it i'll i'll try to find it for you that found that micro influencers so when they had less than 10,000 followers or up to 10,000 followers were actually more useful for brands than the big ones because those 10,000 around their followers those people are really clued into who their people are what they care about what sort of products and services will make sense for them and so if you can start to get in bed with those folks and and target the people following those folks it's going to be a much higher conversion rate so this is less about buying ads on for Google search and this is more about understanding where your people are and who are they listening to that if you can inspire that person to take on your product or to take on your service that's a very a useful way to to move it forward awesome now let's go slightly deeper into our funnel and uh, people who are in the middle of the funnel or the consideration stage in my understanding and correct me if i'm wrong if there are people who are already in uh, your middle of the funnel are somewhere also in the uh, in market audience of your ad uh, platform so maybe your competitor is also targeting them in some way because they have shown some il- inclination towards buying that cert- particular product that you're marketing so so is the question to whether to do competitor campaigns uh no the question is uh, how do you really bring that uh, middle of the funnel audience uh, down into the bottom of the funnel what kind of ad strategy you have to use uh, in order to bring that So different people will define middle of the funnel in different ways. So I think it's important that we kind of define um what what we're saying. So if we consider the top of funnel is they don't even know that they need the thing and bottom of the funnel is that they're picking between vendors. Middle of the funnel is that kind of recognition that yes, I do in fact need this or I need to solve this problem. Let me look at how I can solve this problem. So in those cases we would say that search is probably going to be very powerful because someone's searching for something to do um this is where it's interesting with chat gpt and the, the kind of the ai overviews um we know that ads are going to start serving at least within google's um ai overviews they've been rolled back a little bit but we know that they're going to come back um that is definitely a path forward for middle of funnel because that someone's searching for uh um, an answer but they're not quite sure what the vendor is going to be like they they it, it's kind of like i need to redo the floor in my house do i go to a contractor do i am i picking between wood and carpet like i'm there, there's still all questions i need to answer and those are that's where search is very powerful but this is also where video can be very powerful because this is where you can kind of weed out the people that want to be diyers and they want to kind of just do it themselves versus someone who wants to kind of be scared or not wants to but ends up being scared into throwing money at the problem. And what's nice about video is that you typically can link to products or services off of those videos. So video and search tend to be very powerful here. I would say that display in kind of social unless you're talking about uh forums is going to be less interesting because typically in that middle of funnel you kind of want to be you don't want people telling you 
what to do. You want to own that journey of figuring out what path you're going to go on. And then once you know what path, then you'll be more receptive to that input. So for example, um, I'm doing my, my uh, 10 year anniversary trip to Iceland. I, during the kind of deciding how I was going to go about it, uh, didn't really want input. But then once I realized that, yes, I am going to engage a travel agency again, I did look into reviews and I did look in, into those pieces, which is that that all. So it's, you want to make sure that you're putting content out that respects that people may not want to talk to you during that middle of funnel stage, um, that you're kind of being just helpful. Um, Optimizer, uh, my company does this quite a bit with our PPC town halls. Our PPC town halls are really good kind of top of funnel information, but there's just enough middle of funnel mechanics in there where someone can learn and engage and figure out, okay, yes, I do want to leverage a tool or no, I'm okay. I don't need a tool. I need to just do this myself or, oh, I'm going to engage an agency. So kind of having that, that nice balance is really good. Awesome. So you have been adding so much uh, valuable inputs and uh, my mind is just uh, blowing out with a lot of follow-up questions. I'll try to keep everything in mind and maybe cover most of the things. Now, other important aspect of the funnel part is uh, the decision-making stage of your customer. And when it comes to decision-making, every brand wants to capture that person as soon as possible. So they keep throwing discounts they keep throwing different kind of uh, special offers or maybe run some sales for specifically for those audiences. What is the effective way of targeting people who are already sitting on the fence trying to take a decision? So you- it's actually really interesting with sales. Um, I actually sometimes find that sales are not useful. So sales are really good when someone has already decided that they want to go with you. And they might be waiting for something to go on sale so they can pay the least amount for it. Um, I know I do this as a gamer. I'll sit and wait for games to go on sale, um, even though I, I know I'm going to get them. And I, I've already committed that I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go get it. When you're on the fence, price is usually not the deciding factor. It can be. I don't want to to go on record saying price is never the factor. Price can sometimes influence it. But typically it's the emotional drive of how much will my life be made better by going with option A versus option B and having those really clear um, kind of decision trees and features that tied into human experiences is really, really important. So one thing that I don't think enough brands do is actually invest on their sites of having comparison pages of their different plans, not just the features, but why your life will be made better. And one um, example that I actually think is is really, really uh, well done is actually of all things, uh, the, the, G, the chat GPT price tier comparison, where you had that comparison, and I, I, I don't think it's up anymore. It, it might still be, because uh, they changed their, their pricing. Uh, but whether you would go for the lifetime, I pay for this once, um, or uh, do you pay monthly? And they talked kind of about how you don't have to remember to keep it up or like you, you can just be locked in and you forever get the innovation. And like it, they, they had some human language in their comparison where if I was only thinking about it logically, I, I may have gone one way or the other, but because there was that human element, it was, it was very, very powerful. This is another area where having an influencer can be super helpful. So for example, um, I recently subscribed to the service Nebula. Um, this is a, a real life experience about how Nebula got me. I had been hearing about how Nebula was amazing and great from a lot of YouTube creators um, and how they really want to push their audiences to Nebula so that they make more money Uh, They're able to share more content with less restrictions, all all these things. And for a really long time, I kept hearing, you can subscribe for a lifetime to Nebula for $300 and and that's fine, or you can do it monthly. And the thing that got me over the hump was ironically a video by someone who said, I am not going to make this a sponsorship about Nebula. This is just you're sponsoring me. 
you, if you've enjoyed my content and I've made your life better, it would really mean a lot to me if I, if you would go do this. And that emotional connection is what did it for me and what made me after about a year of listening to influencers talk about Nebula to actually go and give them my money. It took them, it took a year of, of hearing the features, but it took five minutes of hearing the emotional impact. And if you can kind of distill how you, your customers' lives would be made better, that it will do quite a bit. Now, in terms of how that technically happens, I strongly recommend paying attention to performance max and how much your budget is going to search versus video versus display versus discover. Um, if your budget is going primarily to visual content and the campaign is supposed to be more, um, I guess, talking about the, the, the products or it's more kind of feature oriented, you, you may struggle. So if your assets are not aligned to that, to those visual contents, just bear that in mind. Remembering that visual content can be transactional. You just need to make sure that you have that visual content there and that you're matching that level of intent and connection with each channel. And when you're doing standalone search, when you're doing standalone display, standalone video, so on and so forth, it's a little bit easier because you're controlling everything. Um, but in everything you do, make sure that you're building in that human connection and that you're using your audiences to target and to exclude people that you know are, you, you want to kind of engage with or avoid. I realized that was a little bit of a roundabout, but we, we eventually got there. <laughs> Yeah, that's all right. That's perfect. And see, uh, other aspect of the decision making process is uh, how do you, one is how do you really emotionally connect with your audience? The other aspect is there are certain people or certain set of your audience, which are like the discount seekers, even if they have made the mind that they want to purchase, they still look for that one discount. Right? Now, yeah. the chances of converting them quickly. So if you are in marketing, you have you are always under pressure to get more people in, right? So if you uh, if you leave them alone, if you don't give them the kind of discount that they are seeking, then perhaps they would start looking at your competition as well. So uh, do you completely discount the discount part, or you still include that pricing factor in and uh, really target those audience? So algorithms will actually uh, reward you for offering discounts to your customers. So whether that's in shopping or Google shopping, you'll rank a little bit higher if you have a discount on your product. Um, Amazon will reward you for on their platform having a discounted price that you give to Amazon customers over other places. Like there's, there's a number of things where price can be useful. You just want to be mindful about what you're doing. So if you devalue your product enough, people will start to question whether it's good. Um, there's a really interesting number for software where when a software is less than $50, people tend to sign up without thinking about it. Um, and the moment it exceeds that $50 mark, you start having a, a kind of a conscious, okay, I have to think about whether I want to make this decision. Um, it's a similar thing with uh, flights is it's a similar thing with products. There, there's a number for every vertical. So if your product normally comes in below that threshold, you honestly probably don't want to go too heavy on sales because you're you're already going to be uh, what's it called? Getting getting those folks on price anyway. Now there is a value for so for example free shipping. Free shipping especially when unlocked by having a certain number of items in the order or a certain dollar amount to the order, that's totally fair. Um, but you don't want to necessarily lean too much into discounting the products or the service. Now, when you start getting into premium services, um, that's where having something like $100 off of a $5,000 experience is totally reasonable because the person feels like, oh, wow, I just got like a, basically a free $100 but I was, I'm still going to be paying you $4,900. So it's, that's still not an insignificant amount of money and you still need quite a bit of money. Um, but that hundred dollars or $500 are seem like big numbers, but in the context of what you're paying can actually seem quite low. So for example, um, we bought a couch that 
was, I think it was like $2,500. That couch was supposed to retail for $4,000, but we still spent $2,500 on a couch. Uh, That's not an insignificant amount of money. Uh, But feeling like we saved all of that money made me feel good. So you want to make sure that the ratios of your discounts and how you think about pricing uh, definitely plays in there. The other piece to consider is that with services, people tend to be afraid to talk to other people. It's the, it, there's a it's very rare in today's society between COVID and uh, the Zoom population and kind of how we've all kind of retreated into our little isolated bubbles. Uh, we don't like to talk to people. Um, and so having your pricing and having actually becoming a customer tied to talking to another human being is adding a point of friction that your competitors that maybe allow someone just to become a customer without talking to anybody won't have that, that effect. Now, to be fair, when you talk to a customer, you're humanizing yourself. So you may decide that you want to kind of lose those people that didn't want to talk to you. Uh, just so that you can have those really loyal brand advocate people that were willing to engage, that were willing to go through that sales process, that were willing to become your your, your brand ambassador. So it's it's all a matter of balancing how many customers you can support, at what price value are they useful versus not, um, and are you going to be able to continue to support them through all of your various channels, whether that's uh, in social channels and communities, whether that's through email and SMS, uh, whether that's through just continuing to engage with them so that they're not looking at competitors with reviews, all these things. Awesome. So this uh, somehow connects to the next question, and that is uh, the post-purchase behavior and how do you really use the uh, ad platforms to engage your customer post they have made a purchase in two aspects one is the uh, repeat purchase maybe and uh, second is uh, having the best experience with your product uh sorry the what was the last bit uh one is the repeat purchase like you want uh, your customer to repeat purchase purchase from you again right so retargeting and remarketing to them and second is how do you enhance the experience of your product and maybe if you have the content or if you have a strategy to really uh, work on that part as well. So I, I, I think what you're asking is around lifetime value and how yeah, you yeah, need lifetime value, yes. Okay. Uh, so when it comes to lifetime value, a lot of people tend to miss this because they don't necessarily track how long their customers stay with them on average. Uh, they'll kind of start and data will sort of come in and you, you sort of have a rough idea, but you don't have that concrete number. If there's one thing every brand should make kind of a mission that's at the very least in 2025, but start today, that you know how long your average customer stays with you, um, whether it's a product or service, um, and at what points are they upsellable? And at what points do they tend to churn? Churn be- meaning that they leave you and your, your product or service. Um, one thing that's actually kind of interesting, uh, there was, a, in a I keep using examples of things in, in my life because I, I, I like giving shout outs to brands that, that do a good job. Um, Lumi is a really premium deodorant. Um, it's the most I've ever spent on a deodorant, uh, but it's really good. And it was developed by doctors and it's, it's, it's great. What was fascinating about Lumi is that they know down to the day when their products run out. And so with two weeks to go, they send you a mail, a message of, hey, you're not currently subscribed to our auto renew. Do you want to buy a new one or do you want us to discount the renewal, the the subscription so you can have it and be ready to go and be discounted for the year? Like it's, it's very, very smart. Um, And then they'll also have great upsells and it's kind of a great email list and it's, they they do a good job with their emails. Um, But what made it so interesting for me is that typically people tend to ignore emails because they get bombarded. Um, if you can provide value 
and cut through the noise, it's great. But you also need to be mindful that email and SMS are kind of tricky channels to truly communicate value. You want to make sure that you're able to respond not just through email and and text, but that you're also able to communicate and to convey your brand through social channels, your social handles, um, and, and really kind of uplift your customers. Your customers should be striving to be case studies for you um, and that you share those amazing stories on your socials, um, you, that your reviews, that you, you tout your reviews. Um, and make sure that people understand that when they invest with you to get whatever product or service, that they're getting not just the product or service, they're getting the team behind it, that, that, that human component, that human connection with it. Because even if we don't want to talk to humans, there it's very hard to say no to a person. So it, you even mentioned you were trying to get a hold of me to come on this podcast. <laughs> I had no idea who like, that you were trying to get in touch with me. That I felt truly bad about that. And that kind of human connection piece of once we did talk and you explained that to me, I'm like, oh, I feel terrible. Let me proactively go look and make sure I have those, those, those emails and those connections. You just want to make sure that you're doing all that you can build those connections. Yeah. So that part is really nice about you. And I think the next question is also kind of uh, related to that is, uh, How do you really uh, differentiate between two parts of uh, running the ads? One is uh, specifically the in-market audience. So any brand which is new or if you want to get into a different segment, what is your strategy to capture the in-market audience and get best out of that? So in-market, I want to make sure that this is really understood. In-market audiences are built by the ad platforms. You can choose to target them or not. Um, Then there are your customer match or your user first party data audiences, which are gonna be emails and phone numbers. And then there's gonna be kind of those custom intent uh, audiences, which talk about websites or keywords or whatever. If you're looking to target in-market audiences, that means you are relying on the ad network's observation of what sites the person went to, what ads they engaged with versus not, uh, what sort of searches that they've done, what sort of pages they've liked, what sort of channels they've watched, all of those various signals. And based off of the amount of time that someone could reasonably be in market for that product or service, they'll then get added to that in-market audience. And so you can then target them, exclude them, so on and so forth. In my case, I take it a step further. I think about how often are people logged in to their accounts that would be feeding into that in-market audience intelligence versus not. So there are certain channels like Google where When we think about the amount of Google hosted emails where you're actually logged into a Google profile, it's a little bit mixed. I I think the last uh, time someone did a study on this, it was either 60 or 70 percent of folks would be logged in. So that's pretty good. But whether they share the consent is another story. Um, So if someone's logged in, the ability to understand their intent is much better when you do a different, when you take the same person, but you take away their login, suddenly it's throwing spaghetti at the wall and trying to figure it out. So if you're only relying on in-market signals, you're actually missing the step a little bit. You want to make sure that you're layering those in-market audiences alongside negative keywords, um, because net exclusions are kind of uh, the beating heart of, of most things nowadays with privacy. Um, And then where you can also layer in additional um, keywords or topics or things like that. Um, I don't think enough people really consider how important it is for the ad networks that they get targeting right. And so when you share information and when you actually say, 
this is what I find interesting. This is what I don't find interesting. Yes, this is what I've bought. This is, this is not what I've bought. Um, the user experience is actually really, really good. So for example, I travel a lot for my job. Um, when I am logged in, Google is actually pretty good at understanding that I am in an area versus not. Um, and so it'll make suggestions in a pretty timely manner. When I'm not logged in, it actually assumes vacation uh, that is so that I'd be there for a longer period of time. And so I get advertisements for products and services well outside of when I, I was in the area when, when it would have been relevant. So just bear in mind that it is tied to an amount of time for the service as well as how much data the user has shared and whether they're logged in. Great, Noah. So this has been an awesome discussion so far. Now, before we uh, move to the uh, end of the podcast, I have two, three more questions, which I think uh, we should be able to cover. One is, uh, of course, the Performance Max campaign, because everyone is talking about that. Uh, even uh, some SEO folks like me have complained, um, like they don't feel good about having a Performance Max uh, campaign at all. Then there are brands which are able to capture a good amount of leads uh, using the Performance Max campaign. So according to you, what is the right strategy or fitness of a performance marketing Performance Max campaign into your overall strategy? So I actually think that Performance Max is pretty great for most brands with the caveat that if you cannot get at least 60 conversions in a 30 day period, you need to either let Pmax or Performance Max include branded so that it can get those 60 conversions, or you cannot run Performance Max. And here's why. Performance Max exclusively runs on conversion-oriented bidding strategies, which means uh, maximize conversions or maximize conversion value. If you are going to only run uh, Performance Max, the odds of you uh, having enough conversions, especially in, in a brand new account, is pretty low. Um, Performance Max does best when paired with a traditional search campaign that can be very specific. While Performance Max can kind of help you understand what are some ideas that you may want to layer on top, um, as well as helping your budget actually speak to users in those visual spots that you may not have considered or you may not have budgeted for. E-commerce tends to do better than lead gen uh, for performance max. But again, I strongly believe that that's due to the lack of conversion values being shared by lead gen businesses. Lead gen businesses tend to be kind of nervous around conveying what conversion value uh, should be associated with, with their leads. Um, they don't either don't want to get it wrong or they don't trust it or, or whatever. Um, so that's just something to consider. And then uh, in terms of campaign structure, you want to make sure that you do not have one asset group, one campaign, but you do want to consider if you can have uh, enough conversions, you may want to have multiple campaigns with one asset group or multiple asset groups, but otherwise one campaign, multiple asset groups up to 100 is perfectly fine. Awesome, Noah. So one follow-up question on what you just shared. Um, it is related to how do you really... Uh, what kind of data should you share with the ad platform as a business? Like you talked about some part of it, like they don't want to share the lead value or they don't want to give a number to their leads because that is always suspicious somewhere. Google has been like all the ad platform, in fact, have been pushing uh, to share more data, connect the CRM to uh, the Google ad platform somehow so that they can get more information which who finally converted and what was the uh, conversation about. I mean, that 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 has been the, the strategy from the ad platforms. As a business, uh, what should be your response to uh, a situation like this? In terms of the brand Sharing the data back to platform. Oh, uh, so, so in terms of sharing data back to the platform, you cannot expect good results if you don't share the data. Um, yes, there is a certain degree of trust, but every single ad platform hashes the data so they can't necessarily see um, all one to one all that all that data only only you can. Um, and then in terms of results, you can use bid 
caps and bid floors. Um, not with performance max, so that might be a reason to avoid performance max, but with uh, portfolio bidding strategies, you can actually set bid caps and bid, and bid floors um, just so to make sure that you're not overbidding and that you're not underbidding so that, yes, if you share all of that ROAS or revenue information um, with Google, that it's not uh, kind of pushing you too far in, in, in one direction that you actually lose money. Um, so people have been a little bit nervous around profit-oriented bidding. That's a new bidding strategy that, that came out with Google. Um, I would actually encourage folks to try it. Just make sure that you really trust the numbers that you're putting forward if you are going to do profit-based bidding. Um, otherwise, ROAS is safer because you can sort of massage those numbers a little bit to come up with an estimate. With profit, you, you do want to be really particular. Awesome. So I think we can talk for hours with the kind of value I've been sharing so far. But before we uh, finally decide to stop, I have one more question and that is related to ethical marketing. You have been mm -hmm. touching upon the consent part quite a lot. And in the first discussion that we had, uh, you were quite a passionate about the ethical side of marketing. So maybe you can touch upon that a little bit. And if at all possible, and if you allow me... Uh, Maybe we'll record another episode specifically on the ethical marketing part. But today, maybe if you can touch upon. Yes. Um, so I could I could talk for for hours about ethical marketing. That's that's my 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 passion topic. Um, there are certain practices that I don't really feel are correct, um, and there are certain practices that I feel very strongly are correct. They are my opinions. If you, in whatever realm, feel differently, that is totally fair, to totally acceptable. We can have the debate. Um, but ultimately, I think all of us should come from a place of doing well by doing good. Um, so if your actions ultimately come from a place of trying to help your customers, help the brands you serve, you're probably doing okay. Where it gets a little bit tricky is around people, for example, holding ad accounts or website accounts or analytics accounts hostage. I don't really feel like that's correct. There are some folks that may disagree. Um, another thing is around transparency in spend and reporting. I, I firmly believe that every client should have that transparency and understanding if they so desire to understand what is happening in their accounts. Some people may disagree. Um, there's also a question around just taking on clients that you don't have the time for or that you sell one level of service and you provide another. All of these things are around being transparent and kind of, again, that human connection, the energy that you put into the world is the energy that you'll get back. And so when people do well by doing good, they're trying to help, they, typically good energy finds you. When you do negative things, you put negative energy out into the world negative tends to find you. So it's, it's just about being the best possible actor you can possibly be. Thank you so much. And I think based on what you've described so far, it's a good, perfect topic for another episode. But thank you so much for your time today. I think we have been already in the episode for more than 40 minutes. And with all the knowledge you've been sharing, I didn't even realize that we have been so far. Thanks once again. And I look forward to have you again in future if possible. Take care. Definitely. Have a nice. Thank you so much time. for having me. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Thank you.